Sioux was or at East Main. Uh, so that's why that's in there. Have several on our sick list. Uh, need, a, need a lot of prayers for uh, several people and uh, that's all in the news and notes. And again, congratulations to Weston and Myra Horn on the birth of their baby last Saturday. Several things coming up, uh, as always. So uh, again, I just urge you to read the news and notes. And uh, uh, if you need to sign up for anything, you can do so. Any other announcements we need to make this evening? Let's worship God together. Number 851, Blue Skies and Rainbows, and I will be leading the first and third verse. Uh, blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see when my Lord is living in me. I know Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home. In my heart, nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Tall mountains, green valleys, the beauty that surrounds me all makes me aware of the one who made it. Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never song is 255. Good evening. It is, uh, it is awesome to have this opportunity tonight to uh, speak in front of everybody and uh, uh, be a part of service here tonight. Um, I hope everybody that is enjoying or that is partaking uh, in spring break this week is also uh, enjoying that quite a bit as well. I, I want us to, to focus on something just for a few minutes here tonight before class and, and it's this one question, right? I want us to focus and concentrate ourselves on the idea of how do you view God? Here's what I mean when I say that. When I say that, I mean, how do you see God? And, and that's based on what it is that you've gone through with God, and that's based on the season of life that you're currently in. And, and I want you to think about what comes to mind whenever I ask you that question of, of how you see God, right? And, and whatever comes to mind, and that may be appreciation, right? That may be gratitude. That may be excitement for the th sort of things that God has brought you through in life. Or it may be anger, it may be frustration, just based on where it is that you are right now. And, and we think about the, the things that we've gone through and uh, things that have turned out in life either one way or another, and the things that we've prayed about, and maybe things haven't gone the right way. And so maybe whenever when we talk about God, or we think about God, maybe that's just not a, a positive thought right now. But as it is, I want you to think about how it is that you approach that and think about that. And when, whenever God comes up and you, you start to think, or at least you start to pray, what it is that comes to mind, right? Um, and th there's a number of ways that uh, myself and Mallory and Jody and Lenita have been um, so blessed already uh, since we've placed membership here uh, at Walter Hill. And, you know, a huge part of that is Justin uh, and just some of the lessons that he's been able to bring us. And uh, for those that don't know, I know we and him talked about it. one of the first times that we uh, visited here was that Justin was my counselor uh, at Freed Hardman as uh, Horizons Camp about 14 years ago. Uh, bring things all the way full circle uh, 14 years later and uh, we're serving the same congregation together all this time later. God's, God's funny like that. His timing's really funny like that. 
Um, I love the series that uh, Justin's been doing um, here on Sundays this month. I, I love how much of that time has been spent in uh, the Gospel of John, right? Um, John's uh, not just my favorite gospel, it's my favorite book of the Bible. Uh, it's got my favorite uh, chapter in the Bible, John 17, that they may be where I am, or that they may be uh, in me, that I am in you. Uh, I, I think it was just this past Sunday that uh, Justin made a mention uh, from John's gospel where, where he talked about, you know, the, the thing that separates John's gospels from the others is that here we find a focus on presenting the glory of Jesus, right? I think that ties in pretty well with what it is that at least I want to center our minds on here tonight and talking about how we view God. Because this has sort of been the path of study that I've been on lately. Uh, I've kind of worked my way through uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and now as it turns out, uh, I've been working through John every day this month and trying to you know, get through that, especially with Easter weekend coming up and that sort of thing. Um, and, and really, that's a, that's a really, really poignant path to find yourself on, especially when it comes to coming across characters, coming across writers that had a lot to say about the impact that God made on their life and how they saw God, and how they interacted with God and Jesus is, you know, sort of the example there in John. You know, in John 1, we, we meet John the Baptist and, you know, John's, in John in chapter 1, He's asked along the path, are you the prophet that we've been waiting on, right? Are you the person that's supposed to be coming uh, to, to change things? Are you the person we've been waiting on? And it, what do you have to say for yourself? And what is it John the Baptist says in return? I, I am a voice shouting in the wilderness. Clear the way for the Lord's coming, because I'm, to paraphrase here at least a little bit, I, I'm below a slave that would be worth tying his sandals. What does it tell you about the way that he viewed this person that was going to come after him, right? And, and how can we not talk about Peter? I mean, it's like any study through any of the Gospels, you're going to, you know, come across some example where Peter is either the, the recipient of the lesson, right? Or he's taking part in the lesson. Um, but just this morning, I'm reading John 13 as Jesus offers to wash Peter's feet, right? And he takes the time to sort of ex explain the impact of what seems like such a lowly thing for somebody to do, right? But he explains the importance of it to him. And what is it that Peter's response back to him uh, in verse 9 of John chapter 13? Uh, Jesus, don't stop there. Wash my hands, wash my head. I, I get it now. I want to be a part of wherever it is that you're going. I want to be there as well. In verse 37, later on in that same chapter, it reads, you know, at the mere idea of Jesus being somewhere where Peter can't be yet, right? He says, well, why can't I come now? Like, why can't I be there now? Why do, why do you make me wait? And John chapter 6 records Jesus asking, What's left of his discipleship? We don't have time to go into that full uh, portion of the gospel, but suffice to say, he, he asked him what's left of his discipleship. Are, are, are you going to leave me as well? And what is it that Peter says there? Are, are, when Jesus asks, are you going to leave me too? Peter says, you have the eternal words of life. To whom would we go? Depending on your translation. I think there's a lot that we can see about the way that Peter views Jesus, or the way that Peter in turn views God. And there's Paul, and it's hard to choose just one thing to share here, but I'll use this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. We continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith that the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, and so I spoke. Right? I believed in God, and so I spoke. And that's the kind of thing that carries us through as we close out this part of our service here tonight. Think if you had any of these men, right? If you had any of these men, or if you had so many, so many women, so many people that are part of this congregation, right? People, pillars of faith, right? Pillars of, pillars of spirituality, of faith, of courage, of all these things that, we, that have upheld the standards that we know to be true from the Bible, right? These people that we look up to. And if you were to be able to pull these people aside and ask them, well, how do you view God, right? What does God mean to you? What does God mean to you in your life? What does God mean to you 
right this very second and imagine what they would tell you in return. And so the challenge that I, I want to at least impart with us for the remainder of the time that we're together here tonight, go into the rest of the week, go into the rest of the year, is it's, it's tied into this tremendous lesson that I heard when me and Maui were visiting uh, Knoxville. We, we visited the West End Church of Christ uh, there and, and a, a, a guy that a really close friend of mine, a mentor of mine, uh, Kirk Brothers, was presenting a lesson there. And he had this great, great lesson about the simple responsibility that comes with knowing good news. And if I can borrow something from Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, I know I've been bouncing around with a bunch of scriptures, but you know, just bear with me. I hope you're jotting these down. I can give you notes. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and he writes, I love how honest this is, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if Christ was not risen, if the resurrection never happened, we are to be more pitied than anyone else. But what is it Paul calls it later in that same chapter? He calls it useless faith, useless preaching, you are guilty of sin. If none of this is true, if there was no resurrection, if, if this isn't true that we've been professing, all of this is useless. And I, I want to borrow that same idea because if we go, uh, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we take that and we tie that in with the idea of the responsibility that comes with good news, if we go a day, a week, much less a month or a year, right, without sharing something that happened in this big, huge, beautiful auditorium, Right? If, if we went that time without mentioning what God means to us, the good news does no good if it's not shared. I believed in God, so I spoke. But at the same, in, in the same breath of that, right, telling the good news takes knowing the good news. And please, I, I hope you don't misinterpret what it is that I'm saying because that, that doesn't mean knowing the Bible front to back. It doesn't mean knowing all of Abraham's ancestry, right? It doesn't take knowing, you know, every single thing that there is to know, that historians know, that we're so thankful to have these people that, that have studied the Bible for so long and amazing teachers like we have here that are able to present those things. All it takes to be able to, to share that good news and to be able to view God and present that to others is, do you know God? And does God mean something to you? If so, what? Tonight, I, I hope we can take with us and, and aspire to the reverence and the ownership, right? That happens, or excuse me, the reverence and the ownership and the faith that Thomas has in John chapter 20. I know we, we call him Doubting Thomas. I get it. I, I've heard it. Um, but I... I want to I want to at least leave us with this uh, chapter, this verse here as we close out, and where he says in John chapter twenty, he says, "I, I won't believe, right? I won't believe. I, I can't believe this is really you unless I feel where the nails went." And I like to think that, that Jesus took his hand, and he was able to guide him to exactly where the nails went, to the spot where his hands bled. And as Scripture records, he says. I want you to put your finger here. I don't want you to be faithless any longer. Thomas says what each of us should be able to keep at the front of our minds when it comes to sharing the good news with other people. God's life-saving word when he says, all that's recorded, at least in my translation I was looking at today, read, my Lord and my God. Tonight, as we close out, um, you may not be able to, to, to say that for yourself, right? You may not be able to, to, to claim ownership uh, of God in that way, uh, of God's word, of that good news in that same way. And if you've never taken ownership uh, of what God has planned for you in, in, in confession, excuse me, in repentance and in baptism, that's fixable. We can fix that for you here tonight. You can take that first step and God will meet you and we will fix it. But there's also the, the possibility that you may be a Christian that uh, it's just fallen away or just needs prayers. You're, you're mad at God. You're, you're disappointed at God. You're, you're, you're confused by God. You're, you're hurt by God. You're separated by God. 
And the best news of all that we can provide for you here tonight uh, is that uh, there, there is a fixing that is still available and there's family here that can help heal you from that. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave y'all with this and uh, we'll stand sitting here in just a moment, but no matter what you think of God, right? The, the question to start this and to end this, I'll, come, I'll bring us back to full circle is, no matter how it is that you view God, this is how God views you. That you are his child, that you are his creation, that you are just his, right? What a, what a great way to, to really celebrate this week and continue this week. Uh, if there's anything that any, any of us can do for you, we ask that you would come as we stand and sing. I am so Charmed by the world's Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for, for so much, for so many blessings in our lives, Lord. We pray that at this time that you'll be with those of our number who are sick, that you would um, be real, restore them to full health and, and bring them back with us. And we pray that you'll be with those that are maybe traveling this week, Lord. We pray that you'll keep them safe and, and bring them back safely uh, to us as well. Lord, we pray as we go to class that we'll just... Um, be, be glad to be in another time of study your word. And Lord, just as we go throughout the week, we pray that you'll help us to see you as we should, as your word shows us, and, and to see that you are a righteous, holy, and loving God. And we pray that with that, that we'll also be able to see each other in the way that, that you would want us to. And Lord, we're just so grateful for everything. We um, have so much to, to be happy about, and we just especially you're grateful for the forgiveness that your son's death on the cross brought us. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.
Welcome to our class this evening. If you don't have lesson sheet for 16, raise your hand and we'll get you a copy of that. There's one sheet in that one and one sheet in that one. Okay. Raise your hand again for Dan. Anybody? Anybody? Okay, we are in 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. We had uh, gotten down to, I guess, about verse 10. And to set the stage, uh, after Saul failed to destroy the Amalekites, uh, God um, rejected him uh, as king of Israel um, and sent Samuel to anoint a new king. Uh, Samuel was hesitant. He was afraid that Saul would find out and kill him. But uh, the Lord said, well, you take a heifer and go to Bethlehem and... Um, offer a sacrifice there that'll be your cover story and um, and we don't know the exact schedule but it seems like that uh, they had the sacrifice then they went to Jesse's house and uh, as the meal was being prepared that's possible um, let's just pick up there uh, well Earlier, in, starting in verse 8, um, Jesse has his oldest son, Eliab, pass through. The Lord said, that ain't him. Although Samuel thought, that's got to be him. And then Abinadab, and then Shammah. And we pick up in verse 10, thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. Now, those of you who've been in my classes quite a bit, uh, where it says young men in verse 11, and the young men referred to Jesse's sons. And seven of them have already come. And he calls them Na'arim, the word Na'ar. And depending on translation, it can read lad, a young boy. Uh, it can, uh, we've already seen a passage earlier in 1 Samuel where it means a servant. But none of those fit the seven sons of Jesse. Na'ar can mean very special person, uh, almost a prince. Um, maybe West Point cadets. When Abraham went after Lot's captors, he took 318 Na'arim. Those weren't little boys. Those were soldiers because they went up and fought and brought Lot back. So I put that because there's just something we ought to see. We don't see it in the text, but these weren't just run-of-the-mill boys. These were special boys. They were in the chosen line for the Messiah. We don't know that yet, but they are. And... Uh, the seed of David is going to be from where the Messiah comes from. So these are special young men. And uh, what's going to happen is if you go into Chronicles, into the um, genealogies, uh, there we have a different number of sons. If we count David, now we have Jesse having eight sons. That many. I've got too many things in my hand. Uh, eight sons. 
In Chronicles, he only has seven. And they go by different names. Does that mean the Bible's wrong? No, it doesn't mean the Bible's wrong. Um, since Chronicles was written evidently much later than First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, perhaps one of these sons had died by, by then, and so the writer of Chronicles did not include. That's what one commentator suggested. But don't throw the Bible out because you find a difference in the numbers of, of children or whatever. There's usually some explanation, uh, but that's not the purpose of this class. We want to, to press on. So David's out tending the sheep, and he's the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him for we will not sit down till he comes here. And that's why we think they were waiting for the meal to be prepared. You're going to sit down and eat together. We won't sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. You know, when, when we use that term today, he has a ruddy complexion. What do we mean? The, uh, outdoor. outdoor, it has a little different meaning than what it had at that time, maybe. Uh, well, I don't know how to explain this one. Uh, let me think a minute. Um, the word... Let's see if I can figure out how to do this. I think I know. I, I, I thought about it earlier. You remember you read Hebrew right to left. And if you could only see these three letters, it's the same word we use for man last Adam, Adam, Adam. But also the word Edom. You remember what Edom, where it came from? Who settled in Edom? Come on, we're going to have a... Esau. Esau, thank you. Esau, Jacob's twin. But Esau, when he was born, what did they say about him? Red. He was red. He was hairy, but... He, red and at that he was ruddy has to be has to do with red maybe he was red headed maybe he had rosy cheeks some believe it means healthy but today we think more of a rough outdoorsy look and it may be we just don't know but, but just know that behind that word Ruddy is red. That just uh, is part of it. With beautiful eyes. I guess, I, I guess as a man, I shouldn't be seeing all this. But I think of movie stars with beautiful eyes, and I think of Paul Newman. Those blue eyes. I see some of the ladies agreeing with me that that would work. Uh, so, so David wasn't an ugly looking guy because it goes on and says, and good looking. He was handsome. And it sounds, uh, wait a second, are we make, missing something? God said we don't choose based upon what they look like. But if someone is going to lead people, good-looking people, tall, good-looking men have a better chance. Think of your best news commentators, even in local stations. They're usually tall, good-looking men. 
just the way it is. Now the weatherman may be short and ugly, but the, the, the main newscaster is tall and good looking. That's just, uh, statistics will bear that out, studies will bear that out. So David, except maybe for the ruddy, we're not sure of, he was just a handsome, good looking guy. People would follow someone. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Remember, last week we talked about the one that's anointed is the same as our word for Messiah. And you can see Mashak, uh, you can kind of see Messiah in that. So Samuel's told, Anoint this young man, David. He's the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Uh, before I go forward, as far as we know, as, the, as this story keeps unfolding about David, nobody knows what he was anointed for. They know that Samuel anoints him. He does it in front of those other guys, but they don't know what it's for. As we encounter David with his brothers later on, they don't know he's going to be the next king of Israel. He's just a, a pain in the neck. He's a younger brother who's a pain in the neck. That's the way he's going to appear in the next chapter <coughs> to his three older brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Samuel, after he's accomplished his mission, he goes back to his home in Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day. And the Spirit of the Lord equipped and empowered David to become the king over his people. Any questions, comments? Okay. Tell me about that word spirit. Spirit, ruach. Ruach can mean breath. Kind of like it does in Greek. Spirit in Greek is pneuma, which is breath. But um, go back to uh, Genesis chapter 1. We're going to talk more about this, this spirit. Uh, but, but it's important for us to know that once Samuel, as the Lord's prophet and priest, anoints the anointed one, once he anoints, the Spirit of God comes upon David. What does that mean? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit, the Ruach, the Spirit of God, was hovering over the face of the waters. Would we equate it with the Holy Spirit today? Well, I think, I think, I think the answer is yes. Now, the promise of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us as a gift did not come immediately. It came with the new covenant. It came with the gospel. It came with the baptism for the forgiveness of the sins. However, God's Spirit has been here from the beginning, and he used it in a lot of different ways. In this case, he gave it to David. I, I, I don't know what else I can tell you about Ruach. Yeah, it, you know, he had to be anointed, it seems like. It seems like they're related. Related.
Well, I think the New Testament makes that very clear. Uh, we may not always understand it. Now, just because someone is anointed doesn't necessarily mean that the Spirit of God's upon them. But in this case, we definitely do know that it accompanied the anointing. Yes, Dan. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, there was other people also. So. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry if you connected anointing with the Holy Spirit. No. I, I, I'm saying I don't believe that's a connection. No, no, no. In, in this case, though, well, think back with Saul. Did he receive God's Spirit after he was anointed? Oh, yeah, he prophesied with the prophets. Yeah, he did. When, and and um, these kings who, well, they were God's anointed, and God gave his spirit. Now, he took it away from Saul. Now, he's giving it to David, but he's going to give Saul something else. Yes, Brian? I was just going to say, David's in a special group of people as an inspired group. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He 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 became one of the inspired writers also of scripture. Yes. Well, let's see what else. But the spirit, the ruach of the Lord, departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit. Uh, now, let me stop here just a minute. The word that's translated distressing is ra. And ra is normally translated into English as evil. So some translations may have, and they would be correct in saying that, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now, theologically, we have trouble saying God gave someone an evil spirit. Uh, theologically, uh, just stop and think about it. Uh, we, we wrestle with the same thing with Pharaoh. God hardening Pharaoh's heart. We think, why did God do that? God didn't do anything to Pharaoh that Pharaoh was not already prone and going to do. And that's something we need to understand about Pharaoh. Here he gives a, why did he give Saul a troubling spirit, a distressing spirit? I think we could say a punishing spirit. Do we ever pay for our sins? Have you ever been a little gluttonous and they five pieces of pizza at 10 o'clock at night and then lie down and go to bed and you're sick all night? Yeah, thank you for your confession. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that the God is punishing us for that. Nature is punishing us. But God chastises, he chastens his children, doesn't he? And sometimes he punishes us. I think we're hesitant to say, well, I ran into the ditch and messed up my car because the Lord was punishing me. We, we're, we're not going to make those type of admissions, at least I'm not. Uh, I, I hadn't had many fender benders in my life, but I'm not going to blame them on God punishing me. Sometimes things happen in our life. God chastens us. He corrects us. He punishes us. I think punishing spirit might be a good translation for what the Lord is doing to Saul. Saul has rejected multiple times 
what the Lord has told him to do. Saul, like some of us, sometimes think we know better than God. And so he is going to punish him. So anyway, he has this distressing spirit that comes from the Lord because it says it's from the Lord and that it troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. The text makes it very clear that whatever this spirit is, it's from the Lord. It's from God. Yes. So we think this is like the spirit of the Lord. It's an individual. Holy Spirit, right? Is this a distressing spirit or evil spirit? King James says, is that an individual? A, like, a, not a human, but a spirit, person, individual, person? Well, so the spirit of the Lord is with David. That's an individual, right? Uh, an, uh, 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 an individual of the Godhead, is that what you're... Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Okay. Or one of his angels or somebody. But what were, were what were they demons? Were, they were spirits, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, is this what uh, I, 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 well, I don't know, Brian. We can't, you can't, tell. can't really tell from the text, but you might infer from the text that this was the equivalent of a demon that God sent. Could be. Uh, but whatever it is, it uh, made life for Saul very rough. And so, here's what the servants uh, say, let our master, I could talk about so many things here. I put some of these words in here. Uh, if you want to talk more, I don't. Um, that's the source of the divine name, yod heh vav -He, the tetragrammaton, the, what we say is Yahweh. Uh, but Ado, Adon or Adonai is master or Lord. And so when you see the word Jehovah in certain texts, certain translations of the Bible, Jehovah came from the Tetragrammaton, the yod heh vav -He, and the vowels in Adon for master make Jehovah. That's where that all comes from. Don't ask me to explain every letter, but trust me, Jehovah came from putting these vowels from the word for Lord. And so when Jews read scripture and they come to the divine name they do not say that what the divine name is they would not ever say yod heh vav -Hey. they would never say jehovah they would read adonai the same as adon here be lord well I just threw that in. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And the word skillful is yada, which some of you may remember means to know. He knows how to play the harp. He knows. Uh, and, and, but yet skillful is what the meaning is. But he knows how to play that instrument. Uh, and, and so they use yada. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God, once again, no doubt where the distressing spirit comes from, is from God, is upon you and you shall be well. You'll feel good after you hear this soothing music played. It'll drive the distressing spirit out. So Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. So the servants make a suggestion. Saul says, sounds good to me. Uh, go find that man. Then one of the servants, servants in all the previous verses said, Evid, the word for servant, Evid. Here, Na'ar, that word that I said can mean 
young boy, lad, West Point cadet, or a special person, a prince. Now, I doubt if there's a translation that says anything but servant there. I don't know if somebody may shock me and I'd be happy if somebody would shock me with a different translation. Because it might be, instead of one of his servants, might be one of his staff, one of his aides, which would fit Naar better. But anyway, uh, that's just something to think about. But one of the men that was attending to the king said, look, I've seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who, is, who knows how to play. But then he says some interesting things. He, he was looking for a harp player. They found him and said, yeah, he can play the harp. He's a mighty man. He's a Gabor. Um, we first found the Gabors, not Ava and Jaja, but <laughs> some of you will get that, some of you won't, but <laughs> Gabor, we first saw in uh, Genesis chapter 6, before the flood, uh, there became mighty men on the face of the earth. So it could mean a man of well-known, but Jesse's grandfather, David's great-grandfather, was also a Gabor. And in, in the book of Ruth, Boaz was a man of great wealth. And it may have been because of the wealth of Boaz and David's ancestry that this was passed down through that family. Maybe Jesse was a man of wealth. But we don't know anything about David yet. All we know is a young man. That's all we know. And we, we now know that he can play the harp very well. He's skillful in that, and he's a good shepherd. But here he says he's a mighty man of valor. He's a brave man. He's a man of war. Wait a second. He's tending sheep. How could he be a man of war? I think, now this is my opinion, that this servant or this Naar is looking down the road prophetically of who David is. We don't know that. Now, he could have known about David and the bear and the lion. That would make him a mighty man of valor, but not a man of war. David has not been to the army yet. He's not old enough to be in the army. So uh, I think he's looking down the road. He's prudent in speech and words. He's wise, whether that's the way he speaks, or uh, even though it says speech, the, the word is words. Uh, it could refer to his writing. I mean, David did a lot of writing, didn't he? And so he could be looking uh, down the road at who David really is, and he's a, he's a good-looking guy. He's a handsome person. And what's most important, the Lord is with him. Saul knows what it meant for the Lord to be with him from his past. I think Saul knows now that the Lord's not with him. But all of these things make David qualified to be the next king of Israel. I think I've run out of slides, haven't I? Hold on, just. Hold on, just a second, Brian. I'm. I thought 
thought I missed something. Oh, okay. <laughs> you found the other one? Yeah, there's two 16s. I sent you the, the, the first one was taken off a of thumb drive, and then I gave you the, the new one. That's fine. That's, uh, well, I've lost where I was there. Uh, Okay, you find that for me, uh, Eric, and, okay. I thought it was just the training that somebody in that station would receive as a young person going up, growing up, because if you look at what you just said, Boaz, Rich, Mantle of War, the, and then you know that Jesse, if he's not another of the city that we studied last week and the week before, he's definitely rubbing elbows with those guys, so he's not just a common. And you could guess that they probably got servants around, and he got all the brothers. And I just had one brother, but we spent a lot of time wrestling, throwing ball nuts at each other, and all that kind of stuff. You know, they probably had some kind of training them blade work and staff work and those warlike things. It's just yeah, part of growing up. It's well, it's possible. Up. Somebody taught him to play the harp and use a sling. And use a sling. You know, so he didn't just wake up one day. Well, I, again, I, uh, I used to wrestle my brother, but I don't think he might be calling me a mighty but man of war. That wasn't formal, though, but why would yeah. that as part of their formal training? Yeah, it could be. I, again, we're left in the dark because yeah. we don't know David yet. I thought you might know something. Because there was something, didn't they say like at 12, they would pick up the blade at 12, like they were supposed to be ready for it? Um, or no? I don't know. No? Okay. I don't know. That's, uh, all, all the studies I've done on people commenting on this verse of him being a mighty man, I, I think the most intelligent thing, or reasonable to me is that he's looking prophetically but he may have had some insight into David's encounter with the bear and the lion but again uh, I think it'd be hard to call him and, and we'll talk about this more next week to call him a, a man of war uh, it'd be, that'd be a real stretch of the imagination I think to be a mighty man, a Gabor, yeah, through lineage and everything else, I think we could come to that. We could say he was handsome. We could say the Lord was with him. I'm sorry? So their, their nation was at war. Their nation was at war. However, it doesn't seem to, David doesn't seem to be aware of really everything. Because his dad has to tell him where they where he has to go, but we'll get into that in the next chapter. <sighs> you got me. Well, we can get a little bit. Therefore, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, "Send me your son David, who is with the sheep." Why do you have to tell David's daddy where his son was? I, I, sometimes things in Scripture are just kind of. Why did he say that? Well, I say, why did he say that? Uh, and Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them by his son, David, to Saul. So David is going from the city of bread with a load of bread to King Saul. In fact... The way this is worded, a donkey, see this italics means it's not in the text. That's one reason I like the New King James. He sent a donkey bread. 
And, and reading the commentaries is hilarious on this one. Evidently, it means there was a certain amount of bread which equated to a donkey's load of bread. And that's what he sent to King Saul. You don't go before the king empty-handed. He's going to send his son with gifts for King Saul. Does King Saul need a donkey's load of bread? Probably not. Does he need a skin of wine? Probably not. But you don't show up before the king empty-handed, and so that's what David's doing. And I think that's where we'll stop and uh, pick up next week in verse 21. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for putting up with me. Have a good rest of the week.